Uh, so uh, my name is uh, Dan Choi. Uh, I'm a uh, orthopedic spinal surgeon uh, now in solo practice in Suffolk County, Long Island. Uh, jumped into solo practice uh, three months ago and uh, a fourth year in practice. Um, I, uh, when I was a college freshman, uh, Facebook was invented in 2003. So I've uh, grown up with social media, I guess uh, you can call it, and kind of witness different platforms come in to play. So uh, I'm gonna kind of give my take on um, utilizing social media. I've also built uh, pretty big platforms on a multi -platform, multiple um, uh, platforms such as YouTube. I have 24,000 subscribers on, on Twitter. I have maybe around 7,000 and on Instagram, I have like 17,000 followers. So I was pretty early to uh, this. Uh, I started working on social media maybe three and a half, four years ago when I started my practice, mainly because I was twiddling my thumbs and have patients in my clinic. So I thought this was a good way to get myself out there. And so, you know, I wanted to share uh, with uh, Dr. Mehta uh, what uh, kind of uh, learned during that time. But uh, Dr. Mehta, could you, uh, would you uh, be able to introduce yourself? Obviously you don't need an introduction, but it would be great if you could do that. Awesome. Yeah, I'll give my introduction and more than that, my introduction to social media. So I'm Parag Mehta. I'm an internal medicine still practicing and seeing patients every day. I am currently the president elect for Medical Society, a state of New York, and I'm the governor for New York ACP. When I visited AMA many years ago, they were teaching how to use the Twitter. And I thought, okay, let's learn something new. It was really nice. And I left it. Second year I go back and same, Thing that they are teaching. And I said, okay, fine, let's do the refresher. And then I left. And later on, the reason I started doing is that I used to read a lot of articles. And I will say, oh, I read that. Where is it gone? And I decided to choose Twitter as my repository. So whenever I want to go for it, I'll just go to my Twitter account because I have tweeted that article to myself. Next thing I learned is about the Twitter has a direct message. And in that direct messaging, whenever something happened and you're on the airline or right now, I can tell you the real story of Indian crisis. I wanted to ship something and I was not able to reach the Air India regional manager. I just did the direct messaging and I got the answer back. Similarly, there's a charitable organization over the weekend I want to reach. Twitter direct messaging, you will get the answers very fast. And that's where, you know, we thought that people should at least take the benefit of the social media. I do the Instagram to follow my daughters because they are always there. And I have to learn that way. Facebook, I was anti-Facebook and worried about it. But every single picture I take, people wanted me to put it on the Facebook. And then it goes on to the Google and YouTubes and everything. So we were talking and I think when Dan is giving a presentation, it is not worth coming on his way. And he has prepared a fantastic presentation. Couple of questions I want you to pay attention is to that you need to learn about the hashtag which is the most important and he will explain you that if you really want to put your tweet or something in front, your hashtag is important. He will also, also explain you about the handle and creating the list. The second reason I did the Twitter, because when you have to summarize your message in such a short, your brain has to think, how can I use my limited character and give my message full out, right? And then you will learn that, hey, when I created my handle, it should have been the shortest one. And the, similarly, I learned how to shorten your long, you know, web address or any of those things. So there's a lot of learning. It's an intellectually challenging and that's how I started. And then there were times when I was participating into the meetings and you see that how many people you meet and how many people you stay connected. It's something which is positive. I definitely do not want to say that the social media is all positive. There are some negatives and you 
have to be extremely careful, particularly when you're representing an organization, your tweet, your Instagram, and everything can give you a lot of follower. At the same time, it can give you burnout also. So without any delay, I'll not come into the dance you know, presentation. It's beautiful, fantastic, and let's go for it. Uh, thanks, Dr. Mehta. Uh, uh, appreciate your kind words. Um, I really want to make this, uh, you know, next 45 minutes or so uh, high yield uh, for everyone as possible. So uh, we're really going to try to break down some of the technical parts of social media because it is uh, so you guys can dive in hopefully after this presentation. If you aren't active on social media and you've always been curious, you've been afraid, uh, hopefully this presentation will kind of um, ease you into it. That's the goal. And so the first thing is really asking yourself why even get involved as a physician. And so first of all, it's really where our patients are right now. Our patients are utilizing, I'm gonna share with you some statistics. And so because our patients are there, that's where I think we need to be as physicians and as public health experts, as advocates, as, as patient advocates. Uh, that's really where we need to be to reach our patients before misinformation reaches them, um, before um, you know, they get swayed by non-experts um, about medical conditions or the pandemic or whatnot, that's really where we need to be. And so just a brief overview of the different platforms that are out there. Um, you have you know, Facebook, I'm just, we're not gonna go through all the different platforms, but just the ones that are major. Facebook is a pretty, uh, you know, I would say that uh, it's a little bit more of the, uh, the demographics is maybe 50 and up is very active on Facebook. But I would say in the last four years or so, Facebook has made a resurgence in terms of younger physicians and uh, younger people as a whole, uh, you know, 30s and up using Facebook as well, because uh, Facebook now has a very powerful tool called Facebook groups. So there are physician uh, groups on Facebook that you can find uh, doctors on social media is a big one. It's so me docs run by Dr. Coriel. It's huge now. I don't know how many exactly members are there. There's also lots of niche uh, Facebook groups like physician mom group. I think, sorry, physicians, um, the mom group, physician mom group. And that's like mothers who are trying to balance motherhood and being a physician at the same time. That's a huge group. I mean, we're talking about, I think 40,000 physicians or 30,000 physicians uh, are in that group. Um, and then there's physicians who are looking for uh, financial independence, who are trading information about investment opportunities, real estate, how to learn real estate. And there's other groups like that. So it's a great right now, Facebook, I think its biggest strength is actually in these communities that have formed online. Then you have Twitter, which uh, Dr. Mehta uh, talked about. Uh, Twitter is where lots of um, I know Misney leadership are very active on AMA leaders are very active on. Uh, and uh, many physicians are active on. The hashtag that many doctors utilize or place in their tweets is med Twitter. So hashtag MED Twitter. And how Twitter works is it's basically, you know, if you look at, you know, these tweets, it's everything needs to be done within 140 characters. So whatever you're writing um, has to be under a certain number of characters. And then you have followers, like if you look at this, you can see how many followers, um, I don't know if this is, uh, this, this particular physician has 1500 followers, he's tweeted 4,486 things. And every time you tweet something into the Twitter sphere, we call it, um, people who follow you uh, can see what you wrote. Uh, and then if Twitter has an algorithm that figures out that what you tweeted, people like or is of interest to a lot of people, then the algorithm will take that tweet and make it go viral. You've heard of you know, viral tweets uh, for good, for better or for worse, right? Uh, things go viral for very bad reasons. Uh, things go viral for very good reasons. And so um, you, know, the, the, you can make things go viral, but as a physician, um, that's not always the thing you're aiming for, really. You're, you're trying to spread good information. Uh, you're trying to network. And so the, the best way to really figure out how Twitter works is to jump on yourself, um, you know, download the app. There's a phone app. You can also go on the internet uh, on, sorry, on your desktop and, you know, kind of play around with the website. You have to start an account. All of these platforms, you always have to start an account. 
you have to start, a, you have to create a handle. And that's what uh, Dr. Mehta was talking about earlier with hashtags and handles is that you would have to create a name here like my friend Gary Schwartz, who's a, a, who's a pain medicine doctor here in Long Island is, he just kept it simple. It's Gary Schwartz, MD. Now that handle cannot be taken by anyone else on Twitter. So you have to come up with one that's unique and Twitter will tell you if that handle has been taken or not. Uh, my handle is Dr. Dan Choi. Uh, I think Dr. Meta's is uh, Prog Meta uh, Four or something like that. So you know everyone has a unique handle. That's how you're identified. And when you see this tweet here that uh, Dr. Uh, Kara Metopoulos wrote, she you see that she wrote this tweet about sports medicine, about gymnastics, and then she actually tweeted at a certain organization. So here she tweeted at NYU Langone. Peds Ortho, NYU, HJD, and she did this um, because uh, you know she wanted to raise, you know, she either wanted to alert that organization about her tweet, or maybe those organizations are actually affiliated with some information in the tweet. So she's putting those hand tags there. The other thing to look at in functionality in Twitter, and again, if you're already on Twitter, this is all basic. I'm really trying to kind of keep this very low level so people who are not on Twitter can jump on there. Is that if you look here. There is a heart function here. There is a, this, this, this uh, kind of round looking thing is what we call a retweet button. And so when you're scrolling, you have a feed. So you follow other accounts and other accounts follow you and you have a feed. And that feed is when people you follow, their tweets will show up on your feed. And you can, if you like or agree with what they say, you can either smash the like button, which is the heart button, or you can hit the retweet button which actually takes that tweet and shares it with your own followers. So then you're basically, that's how uh, vi tweets go viral because people are retweeting a tweet over and over and over and it goes to their followers. And, and that's how the Twitter algorithm works. So that's just very basic. Another thing is that here you can actually interact with other people's tweets. So if you see there's a, like a, a thought bubble here or um, you hit that and that allows you to reply with your own you know, thoughts regarding this tweet to someone else. And that actually gets shared to the Twitter sphere too. So you can actually see people's conversations on the Twitter sphere. And these conversations, depending on the topic can be very hilarious or very intense, or, you know, they're just, you just see these conversations that sometimes may, should not be happening out in the open because they usually don't when you actually see people face to face. And that's one of the unfortunate parts of Twitter is that there's a lot of toxicity and a lot of animosity because people are like, you're, you're, you're sitting here with a phone, you're not at, you know, talking to them directly. And so you can witness that on Twitter as well. Uh, YouTube briefly, people are making videos. Uh, that's basically how YouTube works. People create their own videos. Um, you can jump onto my YouTube channel, Dr. Dan, see how uh, you can do educational videos, you can do uh, reaction videos, all kinds of genres of videos. This is Dr. Uh, Paul Thomas, who does like day in a life of his day as a busy pediatrician. And um, he has many, many subscribers. You can see it's not followers here, subscribers. Um, Instagram is the um, platform that I've utilized quite a bit. And it really is a artistic platform. Um, and so the beauty of social media is that not every platform may fit your personality of what type of content you want to produce. So, you know, you might never have, everyone here has their own strength. You either have the strength of the written word or the spoken word or theater or photography. You know, it, 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 they really want you to enhance like what you are uh, kind of leaning towards, what you lean towards. If you like writing, well, Facebook might be better for you because you can write long posts. If you like photography, Instagram is a good uh, platform. Like if you can see here, my friends, these are some physicians that I know who, you know, this is a photo that he had to pose for, uh, but it's a very interesting photo. And it's not just about the photo, it's what people write in the captions down here. So I, could, I liken Instagram to microblogging right? So people put a photo that's very catchy. And then you look at and then that gets people that if your photo is catchy, you end up on people's feeds. So the same concept as Twitter is that people follow each other on Instagram, right? You follow accounts, they follow you back, whatnot. And there's a feed of people you follow. And 
the, the algorithm, again, it's all about the algorithm. Here, the algorithm is about catchy photos, which seem kind of ridiculous to most physicians because it's like, what kind of doctor has time to sit there and filter photos and take selfies? And But if you want to get out there on this particular platform and make sure that people hear your message and what you have to say, you have to become a photographer or, or, you know, or learn about kind of the basics, the rule of thirds. Uh, when you take photos, um, be willing to wear maybe pink scrubs sometimes and take these photos. So that's just an overview of some of these uh, um, accounts. I'm just going to go through this real quick. Sorry. Um, this was just a statistic from just a, a couple um, I think this was uh, a couple years ago, actually, and, and things have changed, but that Instagram was at that point the fastest growing application. It was lots of people were jumping on. Uh, we had 30, you know, 2% of the population uh, using Instagram in 2018. I mean, it was just skyrocketing. Now, I think TikTok has really taken off in terms of popularity. Um, Twitter's still pretty high up there. Facebook is high up there. Instagram still has a significant uh, usage as well. Um, and this is some of the other statistics that should grab your attention on like why you should be on social media. Social media back in 2018 was outpacing print newspaper in the US as a news source. People go to Twitter now to check for news uh, than you know, checking news websites even because it's faster, it's faster to get your news sources. And 20% at that time in 2018 say they were getting their news versus uh, via social media than print newspaper. Um, also, 39% uh, of US adults are caregivers and where are they getting their information from? This was some Pew research statistics that showed that caregivers are going online a lot. And we see this in our clinics as physicians that patients are Googling us, Googling our diagnoses, Googling their MRI reports, their results. They're Googling everything before they come into our clinic. So we should be kind of aware of that uh, phenomenon. Unfortunately, misinformation is very rampant, right? And this is very prevalent within social media, unfortunately. We've seen that during the COVID pandemic, um, especially, I, I think, it really hi highlighted um, some of this and how uh, people are out there saying whatever they want. The beauty of social media is that everyone can have an account, but then guess what? Anyone can say anything. Anyone can become an expert, right? Anyone can say well, I'm a, doc, I'm a naturopath and I know the cure to cancer is not chemotherapy because that's what my degree tells you it is. And you can promote that on social media like you're the expert. You can, you can say anything and be anyone on social media and that's you know, a double-edged sword, unfortunately. So this is some posts by anti-vaxxers and if you may have heard of the anti-vax movement, um, you know, it was, I think, popularized by a couple of celebrities, Jenny McCarthy and then and it got a lot of traction and, and, and gasoline was poured on that fire because of social media, really. Uh, a lot of these posts done by anti-vaxxers uh, are very emotion provoking and they're out there, you know, talking about how autism cause, you know, is linked and it's, it, they're very emotional uh, posts. You know, you, you look at this and as a parent, how are you not going to react? And you, you don't know how to verify these sources on social media. And so, um, and, and these are some other uh, kind of, um, you know, people saying, you know, chiropractic care is better than seeing your primary care doctor, uh, which is which is problematic. This is what our patients see. So, I, I, I've uh, co-founded a uh, national association. It was it's called Association for Healthcare Social Media. This was back in 2019, and it was a bunch of doctors who had met each other on Instagram. We were actually posting evidence-based posts and we were trying our whole goal was like look if we can fight this we were really mad and upset about a lot of the misinformation that seemed to be populating uh social media platforms and so if we're out there saying uh evidenced putting up evidence-based posts maybe we can counter this misinformation so that that's one of the reasons why social media for me has become missional in the sense that you can be out there, you can, you can really influence a lot of people if you, if you do it right and you really study all the platforms and each platform has an algorithm, each platform has a way of, if you can form content properly and tailor yourself. And it's like an experiment. Every 
you know, every platform, when I jump onto it and try to learn its algorithm is a huge process. And it's a learning, you, you, it takes time. Um, you have to follow the people who are doing it right and see how they're doing it and kind of tailor your content towards it. But it, it's not just for the likes or the impressions or the followers. It can, it's very missional uh, for many doctors who have big followings. I think it's because we want to spread the message that uh, you, you want, we want to spread good information and fight misinformation. That's part of it. So Dr. Mehta, do you want to uh, kind of weigh in here um, about, you know, wh why you are so active on social media and what, what you, what you, you find is like uh, been the biggest uh, advantage for you? Thank you, Dan. So yes, I was about to say that I was chatting on, and some people are considering that it can cause significant, you know, take your time away, which I fully agree. So you have to be very careful of what you are using it for and how much time limit you put it in. WhatsApp, Facebook, and all those things could be addicting. And it has caused significant problem in young children, female, and everything. So I want to acknowledge that social media has both. It has a positive and it has a negative. And the way it worked that my daughter, when she was in the school, I asked her not to be on the Facebook. And she followed till high school. In high school, if she has to be joining any club because every single announcement were happening on the Facebook. And then she comes and says that, hey, this is how the world is. And I say, okay, fine. You can do whatever you want and be careful. I join Facebook. And then I see that, you know, people want to connect. You find a lot of people. It's okay. Then I gave it to my parents. And all in their 80s and 90s enjoyed the Facebook so much that their day was, you know, short. They enjoyed, they learned so much. Uh, my mother, who loves to do the knitting and everything, she'll be going on to the YouTube and finding out all the new ways she'll be, you know, knitting my sweaters and everything. So I realized that there are positive sides. And then as I was mentioning that, I stayed with the Twitter, only the time when I'm out in certain time frame. lots of connection, lots of learning, Met Twitter, Policy Capsule, politics, as well as the education, both can be done, and the networking. So if you combine all three together, it's worth it. Do I have to do every single time? That is the recommendation that if possible, send it continuously, don't do intermittently. And then you will still connect into the people more and more and more. Once you learn it that to do it on the desktop, it's even better and faster. And there are very many, many shortcuts. Always likes people's tweet. And if somebody's following, follow them up. So try to have fun out of every single one, whether it's an Instagram. So if you follow the National Geographic, or if you follow certain things which are humor, you will definitely enjoy it. So that's how I was doing the Instagram, that just to follow rather than posting anything. And it was really entertaining. I did more because we are in position. And if you are in the leadership position, this is how the world is. And that's what I started the example of my children. So we need to know what the world is like. Without getting involved, you will never know. And I continue doing it. So take it back then from here. Any questions in between for anyone? You can unmute yourself and ask the question. Okay. We'll definitely have uh, an opportunity uh, later on for Q&A for sure. We'll leave some time. Um, but thank you, Dr. Mehta. It was uh, very insightful. Um, I want to go through a few you know, of my own kind of experiences with how social media has really, I would say, supercharged my growth as a physician, the, 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 the ability for me to be in solo practice and in, in this kind of climate in 2021, uh, I think a lot of it 
had to do with social media, to be honest. Um, you know, my ability to build my own practice uh, through social media, uh, to make a lot of connections. So back, I would say, you know, what, 20 years ago, if you wanted to make a meeting, have a dinner with someone or make a connection of some sort, right? You're picking up the phone, you're calling their secretary. Then you're saying, look, you know, my name is Dr. Choi. I would love to have a meeting with you because of this reason. Then that person is like, who the heck is Dr. Choi? There's no such thing as Google, right? And, you know, there, you know, no, it, it, it's very hard, you know, and what social media does is when you have your own profile, your profile on whatever platform it is, whether it is YouTube or Instagram or Twitter, is almost like having your CV to, and, and LinkedIn is especially for professionals. So LinkedIn is another network we didn't touch upon, but LinkedIn is a, a social media network just for professionals who are talking about their professional work. And any of those platforms, really what you're doing is you're putting your CV in public for people. What, what, and you control the narrative. You get to put on your CV on these platforms what you want people to see about you, what you want patients to know about you, um, what your education is, what your qualifications are, you get, to, you get to dictate that. And then when you flip through any of these platforms and you find people that you can maybe collaborate with or you wanna to get to know more about their work, maybe you get to blast your own work. You wrote a research paper that you think is amazing. You know, obviously you did the research and you wanna let the world know better right now, you know, 20 years ago, it got published in JAMA or Journal, you know, Journal of Orthopedic Trauma, whatever. And if it didn't, you know, kind of make waves, it died there, right? It died. Uh, your colleagues didn't talk about it, whatnot. With social media, you have the power to propagate your work and your message or whatever you want the world to know about. And it could be your research. It could be your practice. It could be an advocacy issue that you're passionate about. It could be your involvement in the medical society, whatever you want and people to know about and care about. If you craft the message properly and you put it on your public facing social media account, which is your CV, you can connect with people that much faster uh, because it's, it's, you can make a five second decision when you look at someone's profile on social media, like that's someone I need to meet or that's someone I want to connect with. And even with my own practice, I've, I've had so many, even my first few months, just having dinners with people I've met on social media. Like, I'm like, I need to meet that person because him and I can collaborate for my practice. And it's a quick message. We call it direct messaging on all these platforms. You can shoot a quick message. Hey, my name is Dan, uh, Dan Choi. I like what you're doing. You know, message me back. Let's talk. Let's talk about how we can collaborate. Boom. And they, in turn, can look at your profile and decide very quickly, oh, yeah, this is someone I, I want to collaborate with, I don't want to collaborate with, and they'll return message or they won't. And so it is really like networking on steroids to if you utilize social media properly, uh, in my opinion. And so practice building through social media if you're a physician and you want to talk about results and how awesome, what an awesome spine surgeon you are and, you know, how you cured people of neck pain and back pain. Well, you can make videos like this and kind of post them on social media. And sorry, this video is not working, but this is one like testimonial video that I've done. Uh, it was uh, very uh, well received on Instagram. Um, and this is a huge point here. If the phone is the new computer, right? Our cell phones are, are is the new computer. Social media is the new website almost, right? Everyone had to have a website, you know, 10 years ago. And uh, now everyone should have social media presence in my opinion. Um, uh, again, we talked about networking uh, and how you, it supercharges uh, your ability to network. You know, this group of young physicians on the right, um, if you don't recognize Dr. Mike here is a pretty big celebrity on the left there. We all met through Instagram, actually, and then ended up meeting in person. This was pre-COVID, uh, maybe a couple years ago. Um, then there's also the opportunity to participate in education if you're passionate about educating medical students, residents. Um, we call it free online access to medical education. Um, you know, people are teaching, you know, medical students about how to read an EKG. You know, I made a video here about, you know, how to, how a spinal surgery is done. And I posted that on Instagram, you know, just, just for education purposes. Then, I, you know, I, I want to touch on this a little bit more because we have, you know, uh, we have members from MISNI here on this call. 
And everyone who knows me, I, you know, I currently serve as a counselor for Suffolk County. Uh, I was a young physicians chair for the last two years, a young physician section chair. And I've been really passionate about this, this, this advocacy issue regarding surprise billing. And everyone at some point thought, oh, surprise billing, that's an out of network issue. It's not, not, it doesn't mean anything. And we did a lot of work for the past two years trying to educate my fellow colleagues that this is not a out of network issue or in network, this affects all physicians. This was a, one of the greatest transfers of capital from payers, from physicians to payers. And they were trying to legislate it uh, by putting it under the guise of surprise billing. And we created this campaign online to try to educate our colleagues and also engage media and other advocacy organizations about this issue because it really, um, was flying under the radar. Not too many people were talking about it or understanding what was going on, except a few key leaders here in Misney. Uh, we were the, I think, the beacon in the whole nation that was trying to raise awareness about this. And we created this Patients Over Profits uh, profits campaign. Uh, Art Fugner, former uh, past president, uh, was very involved with this. Uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Michael Brisman, also very, very involved as well as uh, Pervy Parikh. Um, um, who is a young physician uh, section member as well. And, you know, what we were out there is if you see this tweet, you can create tweet threads. So like here, if you see this on the left side, I explained etiology of surprise bills explained. It was a thread. And you can, this is a common, very uh, like educational tool that's done on Twitter where you can compose, you know, you don't have to fit it in one tweet. If you have you know, something that you want to compose and it has multiple points, you know, you can compose tweet threads that are unlimited, 100 tweets all composed strung together. You don't know if people read through all that, but here I, you can see it's one of seven. And I, and my main point here is surprise billing is a total misnomer created by profit hungry insurers that points fingers, that points finger at physicians. It's more accurate to call them unpaid insurer bills. And so the other thing to think about with Twitter is to know that it is the art of headline writing. Whatever you write, you, you have that small real estate and you need to capture people's attention. So whatever you write, you should, you, you've got to think that it's going to be relatable to everyone who reads it and that it captures uh, what you're trying to say. Um, the, the great thing about something like doing this campaign on Twitter is that, remember I talked to you guys about, you guys all have a message you want to get out there. You guys all have your own passion, something that you want to get out to the world. Well, this was my kind of project for a couple of years. I wanted the whole world to know about it. And, you know, when I got the TMA, Texas Medical Association, to retweet stuff I was writing about, that I considered a victory. That was like a win for me. I was like, wow, like I got retweeted by a major state medical association. This is the power of utilizing social media to even kind of advance within um, the advocacy space to try to get to know other people uh, who are passionate about these issues. We also created a video. If you notice here on the right side, this is on the left side, on the top left, that's the chairman of orthopedics at Johns Hopkins, who I met through Instagram. Um, uh, I've met other people on, on this video. Uh, we're talking about Alok, he's a medical producer with ABC. He has actually a Netflix special uh, that's coming out with, um, I forgot, I, uh, it's a big Netflix special. He's, he's a big time guy in media who's coming up and he, I met him through Instagram as well. I got, I recruited these guys to be part of this patients over profit video to care about this issue about surprise billing. And that again, was the power of social media, bringing physicians together. I'm just going to, these are also some sample screenshots. It gets a little bit more into the weeds, but Dr. Meadow was talking about messaging people on, and I mentioned again, direct message, we actually had a chat group. If you notice here on the left, it was the Patients Over Profits chat group on Twitter. We had about 20 physicians who were also, we found each other, we were all tweeting about the same thing. And, you know, what we realized is that the health policy experts were out there, you know, bad mouthing physicians saying we're all greedy. So we were responding to them publicly on Twitter, trying to have debates about how this wasn't a physician being greedy issue. This is the insurers scamming patients issue. And we were trying to change the narrative by organizing. And we did that by creating this chat group and all of us came together and we would share different tweets that we found on the internet of what we found. And we would all kind of swarm that tweet and respond. And so if you see here, one of the guys are 
responding here. He's frankly surprised at this article's lack of substance beyond the basics, not to mention several of their statements. So he and and we got Damien here is why is healthcare so expensive in the US? Because the dudes writing laws for Congress are literally insurer lobbyists, right? So he's changed, we're trying to change the public narrative by participating in this public discourse on Twitter. And, and this can happen, you know, I'm using the surprise billing thing as a microcosm of any issue out there that there's national dialogue on, you know, there, you know, whether it be Black Lives Matter or gun control, there, there's there, these conversations are happening. I, I picked a niche topic that really probably not too many people care about, but these conversations are having happening on, 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 on Twitter. There's a lot of public discourse and, and whether or not you want to participate in that, obviously your personal choice, you know, I, I will warn uh, you that political topics are, 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 are hot button topics that, you know, you have to be careful of as a physician also because it can get you canceled. And, and you know, we can talk about that later. Um, this is just a, a sample tweet I, I put out uh, on April 13th. We're talking about, uh, you know, three weeks ago, there was a, there was this topic of, you know, NPs being, you know, if you guys are not aware of the scope fight, there's, you know, nurse practitioners are fighting to expand scope of practice in many different states because they're using the COVID pandemic as an excuse saying we practice independently during COVID. Why can't we practice independently always, right? Uh, and it's, it's, it's very ridiculous what they're kind of pushing, but uh, at Hopkins, they actually utilized, um, they actually had 74% of study participants receiving colonoscopies by nurse practitioners, um, or, and they were Black, African-American. And so that raised a lot of head, that raised a lot of eyebrows. That conversation about this study was happening on Twitter before any major media picked it up. And Stat just came out with this article, May 4th. We're talking about yesterday. I was, uh, I was reading through this article and I found that I was quote tweeted in the article. I had no clue. They didn't ask me. The authors didn't text me or anything like that. They just stuck my tweet in there, which they can because that's a danger of Twitter also. Remember, you anything you put out there can be used against you as well or used in this sense to be quoted. And they quoted me in this article. And this is the power of Twitter. What you're saying can get amplified uh, because this article apparently is being read by hundreds of thousands of people now. And my quote is in there and I didn't mean for it to be in there, but you know, it, I'm glad it is. Um, Prague, do you want to comment here just on some of these points here about, um, you know, how you've used, I know you're very effective in using it to connect with your colleagues in ACP and uh, MISNI and, you know, how, how you've found that it's helped you with advocacy and whatnot. I just mentioned in the chat before that when you publish any paper, there's a score which decides the effectiveness of your paper. And that does include that how many social media are publishing that paper or how many news channels are putting that paper. So if you tweet and a few more people tweet, suddenly that alt metric core score will be going up. And when you look at the journal, the journal will be saying that this article was the top article or in the top 10 of whatever the millions of articles. So it does make a significant impact and it will also improve the impact factor for the journals. When we are talking about uh, social media and the politics, people do read and they respond. You mentioned about the education. We actually did EKG through WhatsApp. So there was a chat group and anybody can place the EKG without the patient information. And there were several times when the cardiologist came back because that was an MI and patient got cat. So if it is used appropriately, it has a tremendous value in education. Med Twitter is absolutely, you know, loved by many. WhatsApp could be anywhere. It could be misinformation or could be information. Instagram is for more like fun. And politics, there are several senator and assembly people, or maybe all of them have the Twitter handle where you can communicate with them directly and it is quite effective. So they have 
their staff will be constantly looking into these tweet feeds. I can tell you that my organizations go through every single possible social media. Even I may not know that my, myself or my family is in the newspaper or in the news item for any reason. I will get it from my you know, senior leadership that, oh, congratulations, and I say, for what? And then they will send me the article. I say, how do you know when I don't know? Because they have the search engine and they keep looking that, hey, anywhere is the name of NYP. And boom. So yes, it has a lot of value if it is used appropriately again. So that's where you are coming to, ethics and professionalism. So go for it. Thanks, uh, Dr. Mehta. Um, I'm just going to touch briefly on a couple other points here. I was just going through this uh, group chat. If you guys want to place questions in there, we'll try to tackle those uh, towards the end of the presentation. Uh, professionalism is important in the use of social media, obviously the AMA has published some guidelines. Um, you know, I would say just use common sense if it's not something you would say in front of your patients or do in front of your patients um, or your, you know, employer, uh, you know, be very careful. Um, there is a lot of, you know, talking about politics on Twitter and things like that. Uh, you know, just be careful um, because the uh, cancel culture is, um, is, is very, alive we all know that and uh what you may think is agreeable to say may not be agreeable to someone else and uh then your public profile is out there and i've seen it unfold i mean literally there's a cancel canceling story on med twitter like once every week i know a cardiologist who made a bad joke um really bad joke about you know uh some social issue and then bam like they were you we had crowdsourcing of physician like uh, doctors calling their institution to get them off of the staff of that hospital. So stuff like this happens. And so you just have to be careful. Uh, it's a double-edged sword. It's very powerful in terms of being able to network. I personally was actually attacked by anti-vaxxers um, I don't know, a year and a half ago. It was a very scary experience. I had put up some posts about the flu vaccine and boom, you know, I got shared in some networks by anti-vaxxers and then they were trying to leave negative reviews on my public, you know, accounts. Um, and I had to like block, I had to actually make all my accounts private uh, for, you know, a, few, a couple months before I came back on. It was a very scary experience. So just be careful about also patient privacy is very important. If you're going to post uh, patient related content uh, stuff about uh, patient testimonials, um, you really need to obtain consents from your patients. Um, also adhere to any rules and regulations for institution or hospital. If I have, if we have trainees on this call, um, really, really think twice about what you're putting out there, because if it's if you're going to have like a public medical influencer account, remember your senior residents, your you know chief of staff, everyone can see that, um, and you just don't want that um, kind of hurting your progression in your in because you're already it's hard training. I think you're it's a hierarchy. It's just the way medical education is, and you just don't need people above you to have something to use against you, right? So that's that's. That my warning of caution uh, to trainees as well. Uh, here's a sample patient consent for social media. Um, this and the other thing is just when you're on there, you want to have your own voice. Um, you know, you want to be as uh, genuine as possible while still maintaining maintaining professionalism. Um, every voice is different, and yet all can be successful. Just because someone's doing it one way doesn't mean you have to be the guy who makes tweets composes tweets that way. We all have something to share and something great that people need to know about. So, you know, we want you to get on there and share your own voice and really just get started. That's the biggest barrier. If you're sitting here and you're wondering, you know, do I really want to do this? I think just at least getting started uh, is a great first step. If you really want to get serious about social media and you're like, look, I, you know, I, I have a lot of time on my hands. I want to build up my presence. I want to build my practice on social media. I want to uh, be able to network on there. Consistency is very important when it comes to social media. You have to kind of treat it like a second job. There was a time when I was literally setting aside an hour a day and eight hours, to 12 hours on the weekend to generate content. Like I was pumping out YouTube video weekly, every week. And, and that's, that was like a 12 hour process because I would have to pre-write the script. I would have to rehearse the script actually 
film it, then send it to a video editor or edit it myself and then get it uploaded and, and do it every single week was like a second job. And I did that for a while until I had my second daughter. I couldn't do it anymore. Uh, but during that time of consistency, um, I generated a pretty huge following on there. So uh, the other thing for success is find social media players in your niche, in your niche or specialty, see what they're doing to uh, become big and successful. And you can kind of duplicate what they're doing. Uh, and you can search for them by hashtags like med Twitter uh, and then engage other accounts too. So when you, you saw that reply button, um, you can, when you talk to other accounts, you're basically having a conversation with them. It's public discourse. And there are times when they'll see your reply and they'll engage with you back if you make an insightful uh, comment or point. And that can result in them following you back, them retweeting something you said to their following. And that's how you start growing your, your following as well. Um, these are some of our Disney uh, uh, accounts. I really encourage you to follow <laughs> On, um, on, on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram. You can follow any of these accounts. They're always, our communications team is always doing a fantastic job uh, putting out great physician related content. Uh, I don't think enough physicians are utilizing these as information sources. The Misney Tweet and Misney Graham are doing an excellent job. The same with the Facebook, uh, Facebook page. So I encourage every single one of you on this call to make sure at least to get started you do follow the Misney accounts, okay? Other than that, I think we can head to the questions. Um, uh, uh, Dr. Mehta, do you have any other um, comments or um, uh, points you wanna make here? I think we have 10 minutes maybe remaining for seven, so let's have the people ask question. Great, I think we had one question here about, um, I was going back here about starting, right? It was said, uh, how to start an account. Yeah, how to start an account. I think it was, um, if you were to start being involved in social media, what would you recommend? Uh, what sites would you start with? You know, I would pick a platform that you sounds interested in to you, whether it be Twitter, Facebook, you know, and then fall, find some of the bigger, some find some of the popular accounts on there. Um, and, and when I say popular, it doesn't have to be like a media personality. We're talking about just like, you know, if you want to follow Dr. Mike, you know, he's a big media personality. He's sorry, he's a big social media following on YouTube or even on, on Twitter. Um, and you see how he tweets and what, what he tweets and how he does it. Uh, that's one way to do it. Uh, you can follow other physicians, look, search med Twitter, look at other physicians, just follow them and see what they're doing. Uh, then start an account, obviously start a handle. Um, and, um, you know, I think Twitter is a pretty easy site, easy, uh, app to figure out. Um, I would probably recommend Twitter as a good starting point for, for most, uh, physicians. Uh, Dr. Mehta, do you, what do you think? Yeah, I was about to say, again, depends on what you are looking for. So you will find more friends on the Facebook and that can go easily into the thousands. So if you're looking for your classmate or some others, Facebook is fine. The security of Facebook, I can't promise anything. The moment you surf something, they will be pushing ads. And while you surf on one computer, immediately when you go to the work computer, it will be same ads, same sales. Twitter is in your control. Usually it is one way. So you don't have to worry and respond. I wanted to say that people who are using Zoom and they have their own Zoom account, you can stream to the YouTube simultaneously or to the Facebook simultaneously. So if you want to archive your videos, you can do it onto the YouTube and you can keep it as private or public. So that's another thing which is a very good benefit. Um, if you are on the Zoom and you have a limit of 500 and you want to go up to 1000 or more, that's another way of you know going to the YouTube versus Facebook. So that's beautiful. If you're creating the YouTube videos, try to keep it small and simple. But beauty of YouTube is that you can keep all those videos private. So just creating your account and keeping it private is for you to available any given time. Two important things, maybe some people can think about it. If you have kids, you have done hundreds of videos. The videos which you have not done is of your parents and grandparents. 
I strongly encourage you to do videos and put them onto the YouTubes or take their interviews. There are apps called Story Corp, which is archived forever. It also gives you prompts. So what question to ask? I have done it for my several of my patients and the family member. This become a treasure for the families when the person is not in this world. So I had several patients who are very willing to talk to me and when they are particularly on the end stage, it's worth making a short video, long video or recording them. Ask them to sing, ask them to story about how they got married, how they found their husband or wife. And those are absolute treasure. So you can use the social media even for archiving forever. Um, we have done it for Medical Society, that's the County of Kings. We ask the students to interview the senior physicians so that they can tell their experience and their story that what the glory of this society was and how we can go further. So it can be used in many different ways. I already told you that we are using it for the training of EKG, X-ray or CAT scan, and that is very well received. It depends on the enthusiasm of both trainer and training. And you learn every single day something out from the other people. I will remiss if I say that, you know, my Twitter came back because of the lens Austin, we were sitting and he said, you know, hey, let me teach you. And that was my one-to-one. -one. And my another guru is Art Fugner, who respond like quickly, you can get him on Twitter in less than 30 seconds, you will get back to him. So many other things I see the Nandini and those are also quite, you know, heavy user of Twitter. And anyone has any further comment will be more than happy to listen to you as well as learn from you. I'm going through the chat and I got uh, Moshi and, uh, and uh, Rachel um, have had some really excellent points uh, throughout that chat. I would definitely hard co-sign all of these points that they're making here about using YouTube to find resources on social media. You can find tutorials on pretty much any platform on YouTube. If you go on YouTube and just search like how to use Instagram or how to put posts up on uh, Twitter, or how to tweet, you know, you'll know, you find great videos on there. Um, so I highly recommend these points that uh, both are making. These are excellent points. Um, Rachel wrote very nicely. She wrote about that as long as it is engaging, commenting and liking, that will make it, you know, it's worth it. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, screen time, people are asking, you know, how much time you need to dedicate to social media. It, it really depends, you know, on like how serious you're trying to be on it. If you're using it for entertainment or using it for, you know, to really build a public uh, account. And, you know, if you're really trying to build a public presence, um, the more seriously you take it, the more successful I think you're going to get. So it really depends on your level of um, interest in, in, in growing your public platform. I can tell you, I was pretty hardcore about it for a good two and a half, three years. We're talking about probably two hours a day on the weekend, spending 12 to 18 hours producing content. Um, I was kind of a nut about social media. I, I loved it. I loved what I could accomplish on it. But I got to tell you, it also is a, was a huge time suck. Um, I've kind of pulled back from social media, I would say overall, just because of my, you know, my practice and family and, and things like that. But you know, I would say that the more time you do invest in it, you treat it seriously, the, the faster you can grow. I would recommend one podcast if you really wanted someone to get some inspiration for about is, is, is he's kind of curses like a sailor during the podcast. And he's, he's very, uh, he's a little bit like edgy. Uh, but um, his name is Gary Vanderchuk, uh, Gary V, uh, V-E-E. -E. Uh, and he talks about, you know, why social media is important and how to, he was kind of like my original inspiration for, you know, putting a, a you know, regular amount of time into getting my message out there. So I recommend you listen to him. He has a pretty well-followed social media following as well um, and whatnot. Um, who, uh, do we have any other questions we can answer? I don't 
Yes, Rachel agrees with me that Gary V is amazing. So, you know, if you want to, if you want somewhere to start too, you can start listening to his podcast. Uh, he's, he's great. All right, any other questions? Let's see, what other, uh, what do you see your major benefits from social media? Uh, Dr. Mehta, you want to take that? I think we're going to wrap up probably in two minutes, but maybe you can uh, answer that real quick. I think we already spoke about it. The social, the way I thought about that is an intellectual challenge. Mm -hmm. And the way Rachel mentioned that it has to be engaging. I mentioned that I take the picture of my grand round speaker. When I'm attending the grand round keynote or any of the conferences, I try to summarize the take home messages. So that is for me, but then eventually people can follow and people can connect. So if you are reading an article that's typical, I read two magazines the, like Harvard Business Review and the McKinsey. They have great article. Whatever I like it, I'll just immediately tweet or retweet from that place or like it. So when I go to the tweet, which I have liked, I can go back and look into it. There are sites for the inspirational quotes or any of those, you know, you like platform, you just follow that. I follow Eric Topol. And he writes very nice tweet and he says, you know, hey, I go back to my Twitter and then look for any kind of, you know, research. So it depends what you like, you will get it. So that's in a nutshell. All right, guys. Uh, I think we're going to wrap up here. Um, uh, thank you guys all for joining us uh, today. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Uh, feel free to reach out to Dr. Beta or I. Uh, any any time uh, I'm on Instagram at spinedocny, uh, on on Twitter at drdancchoi. You can feel free to DM me. And Dr. Meta is available on Twitter at parag p a r a g meta m e h t a six. The number six. Okay. Uh, thanks again, and uh, have a great night, everyone.